He liked to kill animals. It was a game he'd play during the longer drives. Jones wasn't a bad guy entirely. He wasn't particularly rotten, at least not to the core. He'd never kill a dog, for example. That would, of course, be wrong. Dogs were part of the family. They could be loved, and they could love in return. No, dogs were like people. You couldn't kill one. Not even the smaller, louder, more opinionated ones, no matter how annoying. Cats? Cats were something of a middle ground. Jones had no doubt that they could be loved, but he wasn't convinced that they could return that love. Not like a dog. A good dog would be loyal, but to Jones, a good cat was one that just did its business outside. Cats would go where the food was. They'd never love their owners, not really. Martinez, one of Jones's co-workers, reckoned that if a dog was as big as its master, it would still show love, but if a cat was as big as its owner, it would eat them. But they were still a pet, so he wouldn't aim for them, but he wouldn't break for one either. That seemed fair. Deer? He would avoid, but only because hitting one would wreck his car, and in its current state of disrepair, such an impact would all but finish the old girl off. Most people seemed to consider deer to be cute, like a cuddly toy, but to Jones, they were vermin, along with every other untamed creature roaming around out there. Squirrels, frogs, mice, rats, hedgehogs, they were all fair game. Foxes? In his mind, they were like dogs, but after one of them had been bold enough to wander into a house on the other side of the city and gnawed off a baby's finger before being chased away by a horrified mother, he decided that they were viable targets. Kids should be protected from those dirty, filthy beasts. Jones worked for a small Chinese restaurant on the south side of the city. Satisfaction was the name of the place, and despite sounding like an unconvincing massage parlor, it was well known for making some of the best Chinese food in the country. So much so, in fact, that customers would pay extra just to have it delivered to them from across the city rather than ordering it from somewhere local. And so, this was Jones's lot in life. Driving back and forward down streets and lanes and over bridges, both in rush hour when roads were crammed with sluggish traffic and also when they were empty at night. Despite his flaws and a university degree in politics, which sat in proud frustration on his bedroom wall, he enjoyed the simplicity of his work and took at least a small amount of pride in doing it to the best of his abilities, ensuring that each evening between the hours of 5 p.m. and midnight, customers received their food promptly before it would get cold. There are few things worse than a cold Chinese meal. A driver, whether delivery or long haul, has to amuse themselves somehow, filling each journey with pastimes designed to rescue the mind from a fate worse than boredom. For Jones, it wasn't the radio or an audiobook which saved him from the jaws of monotony. No, it was a game, a nightly target to reach, to see just how many unsuspecting animals he could nail with the wheels of his car. The game had a simple scoring system. One point for a frog, two for a rat, three for a hedgehog, and four for a squirrel. Once he even hit a badger, which he decided was surely worth at least five points. Of course, during many shifts he scored zero, and then on others maybe a paltry one or two, but on this night he was flying. He managed to crush one hedgehog, a whole group of frogs in a single go, and a squirrel, although he acknowledged that the squirrel was already dying, having been partially squished by another vehicle, its back legs mushed into the ground, but with a subtle shift of the steering wheel, Jones was sure to finish it off, claiming the points in his process. Happy in the thought that his car, his old girl, had added to her own grim tally for the night. Despite his glee at the crunching sound and subtle vibrations of the old girl claiming a good number of prey in quick succession, there was an annoyance about the situation. He had just been a few minutes from finishing work, with his mind turning to the beers nesting in his fridge, when a regular customer put in a big order, at five to midnight. It was to be delivered to a suburb in the north of the city, and even with the roads deserted on a Monday night, it was still at least a 30-minute drive to get there. This meant Jones would not be sitting on his worn, red lazy boy chugging a cold beer until at least half one in the morning. 
It was more than enough to put him in a sour mood, but despite the animosity burrowing inside, he did take his job seriously and knew that the delivery had to be made. After ten minutes or so of driving through the empty city streets, with the only sounds for company, the grumbling engine of his rusting car, the Chinese food rustling away in their containers and back on the passenger seat, and the occasional splash of rubber through oily puddles gathering quickly in the intermittent rain, Jones began to amuse himself once more with the game. Could he add to his tally for the evening? If he did, it would surely be a personal best. The old girl's glistening tires skipped across the wet road surface as she was guided by her faithful master onto Hope Street. The irony of such a name was not lost on Jones. It might have once been a place for aspiring young families and a burgeoning industry, but now it was nothing more than a shell. Rows of multi-story buildings, blackened with grime, flanked either side of the road, their windows boarded over with bruised and battered metal panels obscuring the empty spaces inside. The entire area would have been flattened, but the city simply didn't have the money to do the job, nor fix the potholes on the surface of the streets which were causing havoc for the old girl's already ailing and arthritic suspension. Indeed, Jones would have avoided the place altogether if it didn't save ten minutes from his journey. The only people who frequented such concrete graveyards were the homeless or drunks and drug addicts. Maybe an occasional group of kids who would manage to bend one of the metal shutters back far enough to slip inside to the darkness and mess around with whatever was left of the building's skeleton inside. It was surprising that he'd never heard of anyone being hurt in one of those eyesores, warned as visitors were of the dangers of the rot inside by occasional condemned signs. Ironically themselves, rusted and cracked as if the treacherous stagency of the place were contagious. But for these sporadic guests, the place felt dead. Jones saw it for only the briefest of moments. He leapt across the abandoned road straight in front of the car. He didn't have much time to react, but his mind was already on his points tally. And being a seasoned pro at that sort of thing, with the deftest of touches to the steering wheel, the old girl responded quicker than her rusted body would have suggested possible, making sure both the driver and the car... Got the kill. Bang on target. It was quite clear that Jones and his weathered metallic accomplice had ended the animal's life as a loud squelch spat out into the night air. The car rose up and shuddered on the driver's side slightly as the front wheel rolled over the body before the rear wheels finished the job. The sound of bone crunching was louder than expected, and for a moment... He was convinced he'd heard what sounded like the animal shrieking. A high-pitched shrill was cut through the quiet like nails on slate. Instead, of all the tiny bodies his nightly drivers had severed and broken, none had been accompanied by such violent protestations, no matter how brief. Looking in the rearview mirror with a curious smile on his face, Jones was slightly disappointed that there was no evidence of the kill left behind. The car must have entirely eviscerated the carcass. That would have explained the loud screeching sound. Still, points were points, and reaching a personal best was enough to make the late-night delivery worth it. But which points to award himself? He wasn't entirely sure what he had hit as the animal seemed to leap up out from an open drain at the very last minute. The area was notorious for its rat, but even by those standards, that would have been the largest rat he'd ever seen. A cat, maybe? The more he thought about it, the more the size of the animal surprised him. It was really that large. It certainly made an horrific noise as it was mangled by the hulking mass of his car, suggesting something bigger. After contemplating an appropriate scoring system for unknown, he settled on six points for something as big as a large cat, maybe larger, and congratulated himself on finally beating his score from the previous year. Perhaps a couple of whiskeys to accompany those beers in the fridge would be a suitable reward for such a grand achievement. It seemed only right to recognize the occasion. Life is full of little victories. 
navigating around the insidious holes in the road, turning into similarly vacant streets, poking like veined branches through another web of crumbling and decrepit buildings. It was only after a few minutes that Jones first heard the noise, an intermittent clicking, grinding, which grew louder with each corner and uneven dip in the road. He ignored it to begin with, because it was hardly out of the ordinary. Barely a week would go by without something going wrong with the old girl. It's been the source of regular arguments between himself and his girlfriend a few weeks back. She wanted him to take it to the scrap heap or trade it in, so Jones did what was left to him. He traded in the nagging pain in for a cute shop assistant on the west side of town. Less mileage, too. And so, for a few subsequent vacant blocks, he ignored the noise as best he could, but deep down, he knew that sooner or later he'd have to attend to the issue. Killing his speed in the hope that pushing the vehicle a little less forcefully would somehow magically fix the problem, the old girl warily pushed on. For a few minutes, it seemed that being gentler had worked, soothing the rusted beast, but that hope vanished when the car turned onto a long straight avenue, which pierced its way between the shells of three or four once prosperous factory buildings. Now he could feel the noise, something loose moving beneath. A scraping vibration sliding along the undercarriage of the car. Edging forward from the rear, it had dislodged itself from the back axle and was now below the seats behind, but still he tried to ignore it. Whatever it was that hung between the car and the road, he'd check as soon as he'd made his delivery. Tiredness was setting in, and the jubilation of his recent high score was now beginning to wane. He just hoped that old girl could get him home. He didn't really care about anything else and did not relish in the thought of breaking down in such an isolated place. It was strange to think of remoteness in a city of hundreds of thousands of people going about their existence on a daily schedule which had to be kept, had to be followed religiously, sleeping, working, pointless. In any case, the noise was probably just the remnants of his last kill caught on a loose piece of metal, swinging about and wiping its crushed insides over the undercarriage with each bump of the falling suspicion or tired turn of the wheel. The previous year, he'd hit a hedgehog, which somehow got caught on the other side of the car, its body sheared in half and stretched unnaturally long, scuffing the road and like skin on the sandpaper. Yet in the back of his mind, he still felt this sound and worried that the scrapes and intermittent clicks were not the result of an eviscerated rat or a cat battering against the ground and undercarriage, but something wrong with his pet instead. His old girl, whom he'd grown quite attached to. As the car plodded down the long, crumbling street, the noise continued to move further forward, slowly, almost meticulously. Jones strained his ears, trying to ascertain its nature. He'd always wanted to learn more about the workings of a car, but in the end, he never bothered to, even though he used one daily and relied upon the old girl, in fact. It could have been many things, but what troubled him most was not the presence of the noise, but rather the nature of it. The sound moved, and as it did so, a cold shiver washed over him, almost frightened by the thought of the jagged grating reaching the other side of the driver's seat where he sat. Inch by inch, metal scrapes and muffled clanks sounded as the problem swung and juddered with each and every concrete indiscretion. Closer, still closer. Finally, and with no small amount of aggravation, Jones decided to pull over and take a look at what was wrong. Better setting his mind at ease than feeling that strange anxiety building inside for the rest of his journey. The engine coughed a little and the body of the old girl shivered in the cold as she pulled to the side of the road, straight in front of an old factory with bubbled and peeling white walls, a pair of once proud and looming front gates now broken resting on the withered grass attached to the crumbling pavement, and its hundreds of windows either smashed or covered by weathered and cracked wooden panels. He sat for a moment in the uncomfortable stillness of the car, a car which should have been moving, should have been going. Stationary, its very purpose held mute. The internal workings of the old girl bubbled slightly under the bonnet, not so much a purr, as an aged breath filled with the phlegm and fluid of a failing biology. To him, this noise was comforting in a way as it seeped through from the engine to the dashboard. Yes, her breathing might have been difficult, but she was still alive, damn it. 
and the sounds she produced were soothing, like a child listening to a grandparent wheeze. Yes, still alive. As Jones listened to that mothering, familiar noise, he strained his ears slightly, wondering if the problem was perhaps worse than he'd originally assumed. For as he sat there in the driver's seat, a tapping, clicking, scraping sound began to emanate from the undercarriage once more. If he had known better, he would have said that it was more like something clinking their nails against metal than that of an actual mechanical problem, but that, of course, was a ridiculous thought. And yet there it continued. Tap. Click. Scrape. And then silence. The sound of the car's troubled inhalations once more dominating the abandoned street. Tap. Click. Scrape. Again, it sounded rhythmic almost. Tap, click, scrape. By now, he was beginning to scare himself a little. He wasn't normally one to entertain fights of fancy, but there was something about the entire situation which did not sit right with him. He'd driven countless of nights for years delivering food to customers. Almost every inch of the city and even a couple of nearby towns had all witnessed the sight of Jones and his old girl chugging through the streets. Even that place, that forgotten, rotten place in the city which had at once been host to prosperous neighborhoods mixed with the huge, sprawling factory buildings which kept the community thriving. Even there, he'd driven through many times. Hell, it was quicker to get to the north side this way, despite being eerily stagnant. But things felt different sitting there. The steam rising from the front grill, the broken concrete and vacant shells which once homed or employed people. Alive, yes, alive people. The place felt emptier than he was used to, but not completely empty. Not altogether vapid and lifeless. Tap, click, scrape. Again, the noise of nail on metal, that tapping sound rang out. Or was it a click? Jones began to doubt himself. For the briefest of seconds, his attention shifted as he glanced to the side and thought of busy workers in blue overalls funneling into that once shining factory, hammering, twisting, manipulating, creating. Alive, yes, still alive. Tapping walls, searching for a hollow, a cavity, for something more concrete and solid. A place to drill. Condensation began to collect in the car, and as the windows steamed up, Jones rolled down his to take a breath of the fresh night air. But it wasn't fresh, nor clean. A sewer must have been opened in the street somewhere, a manhole cover removed, broken, or a drain backed up. The stench of the place reminded him of a rubbish dump he often drove past, the smell of rotting vegetables and decomposing things. Tap. Click. Scrape. With the window down, he could hear the noise more clear, and he could better estimate its placement. Tap. Click. Scrape. Silence again. Nothing. Jones wasn't a mechanic, and he knew little about cars, and so jumped to a generic fault he was sure he'd heard somewhere before, possibly on television, or from someone more knowledgeable in such matters. An oil leak underneath. Perhaps that would somehow cause the tapping, clicking, scraping noise. He barely had time to convince himself on that theory before it sounded once more. Tap. Scrape. Only twice this time. No clicking? Maybe it's getting better, Jones thought, trying to alleviate the sense of dread which was now clambering up his spine. And then... A new noise. Something different. This time it wasn't a tap or a click, no, but it was familiar. He had once sat at the side of a motorway and watched curiously as a rescue service crew tried desperately to resuscitate a passenger who had been horribly injured in an accident. Jones felt sick, but it wasn't the memory of that gruesome scene which caused him discomfort. He believed that it was probably the passenger's own fault for getting into a car with an incompetent driver. No, it was the similarity between this sound 
and the one he'd heard that day which caused him to shiver slightly and break out into a cold sweat. It was the sound of something cutting through metal, and it was coming from under his seat, yet a far more sinister sound than that of a rescue crew cutting an already dead passenger out of a car wreck with a powered saw, for here the metal split and shrieked as something sliced through it. But there was no buzz of a revolving blade, no mechanical noise at all. There was only the sound of metal giving way to quick, sharp strikes. No, no, this is crazy. It's just the old girl again. With a quick turn to the key in the ignition, the car fell silent with one last gasp of air. With that silence came the sound of the neighborhood, poking its head intrusively through the open car window. A slight wind rattling a corrugated rooftop, buildings creaking under their own weight, and the occasional scamper of rat feet, the only indication that life still saw fit to call such a place home. But no tap, click, scrape. No sound of metal being clawed and sliced. Letting out a long sigh of relief, he concluded that it must have been something wrong with the car as the noises ceased when he turned off the engine. He wasn't keen on spending any more time in that place than he had to, so he took a torch from his glove compartment and, with a deep breath, opened the car door, stepping out onto the soaked and crumbled road. The torch was a cheap little number he'd bought from a local supermarket with a black handle and an orange head. No point in coughing up money for an expensive one he'd hardly use. Still, as he stared up at the grimy white factory building in front, he was glad to have it. Many of the streetlights were out, a few occasionally flickered, inspiring little confidence in their continual support, so having that meager, flimsy torch provided at least a modicum of reassurance. The thought of being stuck in that street if its lights went out was not something which Jones wished to dwell on, but despite his hurry, he could not help but turn his attention to the factory building itself. Old buildings creak, and rats take over any abandoned place, but a crazy thought now entered his head. What if the occasional scampering sounds were not rats at all? But something else. A plague of things running around the festering basement of that one busy place, sliding around in the dark. Forgotten. Jones shuddered momentarily before simultaneously laughing and chastising himself for being so easily frightened. It was an old building, simple as that. Times must have been hard for a few decades earlier, and businesses moved to better areas or just went bust. A place like that gets all kinds of things running around it. Normal, diseased, annoying vermin. That's all. On a better night, he and the old girl would have happily claimed them as all points for the scoreboard. Taking another deep breath, he shone the light from the torch at the side of the car. He paused, only for a second, as the memory of that scraping and slicing a metal sound made him think twice about looking, but never mind that. There was food to deliver, and it would be getting cold. He'd be receiving a few complaints, no doubt, from his boss, but right now all that mattered was checking the underside of old girl and getting her back on the road, at least for long enough to get the delivery done and then go home. A mechanic could wait until the morning, as long as the car could drive. Jones crouched down, resting his denim-clad knees on the wet road surface, being careful not to tweak his left knee as it always gave him a bit of pain when driving after a few hours. Hesitation took hold, but after listening for another moment and hearing nothing but the scampered, pattering whispers of the old factory building's rodent population, he quickly shone the light underneath. Nothing. (laughs) Thank God. There was nothing hanging down from the old girl that he could see, but a chill caught Jones off guard as he glimpsed what appeared to be the impression that something had been there. On the undercarriage, the oiled and muddied surface had been scarred. What looked like scratches, where something had clung onto the car, could be seen. Several at a time, seemingly climbing from the rear toward the front. He adjusted his torch once more. What the hell is that? 
directly under the driver's seat, a large incision, as if someone had taken a cutting tool and torn through the metal flooring, scarred the underside about a foot across. The cold, rotten air throbbed through Jones's lungs as his breath grew anxious. The light from his torch shone through the slit and into the interior of the car, exactly beneath where he'd been sitting. Standing up abruptly, he stepped back away from the old girl, just enough to give him a feeling of safety. But safety from what? Okay, so there was a gash across the floor of his car, but that didn't mean that something did it. Something alive? No. It made much more sense that he'd scuffed the undercarriage of an unseen obstacle on the road. But wouldn't he have heard it? Maybe. Maybe not. It was late, and he was tired, so his attention could have been elsewhere. Or it could have started out as a small crack, and the strain of the old girl thumping along those potholes could have been enough to stretch the gouge. Yeah, that was increasingly likely. Jones calmed himself slowly, assuming that in his zeal to flatten a few local animals and beat his personal best score, he just swerved over an uneven bit of road, a speed bump, or a rock. There was simply no way an animal could have done that, was there? No, surely not. Looking down at his feet, the realization presented itself that he had taken quite a few steps back in his panic, enough to take him over the threshold of the factory grounds, next to the gates, resting like two large cadavers, forgotten by both family and friends, consumed by the dirt and soil. One day they wouldn't even be visible, completely devoured by the ground, and yet once they had stood tall, strong and proud, welcoming industry into their embrace. He turned to the factory building with his thought. With enough time... It too would be gone. Its once shining white walls now cracked, bubbled and moss-ridden. They too would be consumed. Claimed by the wind, the earth, the roots, and the weeds. But what if it had already been claimed? What if something took up residence there to be left alone and you, you idiot, are standing on its property? Another ridiculous thought, but a creeping feeling once again took hold, like someone watching from the windows. And for the briefest of seconds, Jones was convinced that he'd seen movement upon the fourth or fifth floor, something which glanced past the window. I wonder what they made in there. It was time to move. As Jones felt he'd scared himself enough with his idiotic and juvenile contemplations, the product of a board delivery takeaway driver, but the available choices were not too pleasant to him. Phone someone to come pick him up? That would involve waiting around for a while, and that was something he had no desire to do. Walk out of the place to the main road? He knew the area well, and it was probably at least a 20-minute walk before he would be out of that forgotten neighborhood, looking down the street at the other old factories and occasional residential buildings. They all spoke of things rummaging around at night. He just wanted to get out of there quickly. Going back to the car and driving out of there seemed the fairest option, but while Jones had tried to convince himself that there was nothing those deep metallic scars other than a bump or two, their very nature still suggested to him deep down that something with purpose committed the violent offense. The indefinite patter of scampering feet once more sounded from the factory building, and with the thought of a swelling mass of rodent tails and claws exploring the night, Jones stepped forward cautiously toward the car in hope more than anything else. Yet as he sat back down into the river's seat, a noise again grabbed his attention. He turned in its direction and saw for the briefest of moments a movement but like the common phantoms which we all see from time to time out of the corner of our vision, the source of the movement was not present long enough to be identified. Overhead, nearby a street light had flickered in tandem with the activity, and all Jones could think of was green. Dark, putrid green. That was the impression of it. Fear was still present, but so too was curiosity. It was an animal. It must have been an animal. It couldn't have been anything else. The 
factory looked on sternly, and Jones shuddered in response. This is ridiculous. Standing up once more, he exited the old girl. A subtle breeze blew through the streets, not carrying freshness, life, carrying with it a foul stench of rot, then a sound of wet. Something viscous and animated poured out from the rear of the car, receding quickly into the old girl's shadow. Yes, he was convinced. There was something moving around back there. The light from the torch quivered, and Jones looked down at his hand, doing likewise. Closer to the rear of the car, he moved, and with the proximity, that wet sound continued. The street lights flickered and rattled again, but he did not register, no so much as contemplate their temper, for he was convinced that he had just seen the slightest flash of gray, pallid, green skin, bobbled and warded, retreat farther behind the car. What was that? A rat? No, there was no suggestion of something warm-blooded. Whatever it was gave off a cold impression. Then anger began to rise. He still discounted the possibility that an animal could have torn up his car floor so badly, but he knew one thing. Whatever it was that he had hit, it wasn't dead yet. A bang echoed across the street from the factory building, a clatter of falling masonry, a broken floorboard or an old pipe seizing up and giving in to an expanse of fetid water inside. Whatever it was, Jones was in no hurry to find out. What he was in a hurry to do was expel that horrid animal from under his car. He'd crush its skull in with his cheap torch if he had to. He couldn't have it scampering around under the old girl. He didn't believe that it could have torn through metal, nor he didn't believe that at all. But for some reason, he did believe it to be the reason for his impromptu stop in such a lonely, rotten piece of the city. Yeah, that little shit would pay. Jones considered that he might even give himself extra points for dispensing with a horrid piece of roadkill so manually. Probably be putting it out of its misery in any case. Slipping quietly this time onto his elbows, and silently as possible, lying flat on the ground, he didn't want the thing to know his plan. But he was convinced vermin couldn't love. He wasn't so sure that they couldn't think. Gripping the torch now like a club or a sword, its beam shone under the car once more. He couldn't understand it. Again, there was no sight of an animal. None. The marks and gouges were still on the undercarriage, but no animal itself. Drawing in closer, Jones slowly pushed his head into the shadows underneath, his arm protruding forward to look behind the tires. Nothing. Almost disappointed, he began to slide his head back out from under the car, only to be stopped, frozen to the core. He knew why he hadn't seen the animal. It wasn't under the car, it wasn't hiding behind a tire, no, it was curled up inside the wheel arch, above where Jones's head now sat, sitting there in the darkness of the curve above the tire, motionless, but as Jones saw it, not lifeless, no, it peered through two front-facing eyes with intent. The torch was now by his side, still in his grasp, but he did not move it to take a look. He couldn't entirely perceive what sort of animal it was. All he could see were two eyes, the impression of a mouth and a nose. If he had known better, he would have said it was almost human. In fact, it was very human, like the disfigured, dark green head of an old woman wedged between the tire and the oiled metal of its shielding arch, but no, it was more than just a head. There was the suggestion of appendages, and it had squeezed the entire contents of its sagging body into that tight space like a coiled snake or a rat in a drain pipe. Yet Jones dared not move. For although it had shoved itself into that confined part of the old girl's body, it was impossible to know its true size, or its true nature for that matter. It could have been harmless, but those eyes staring so fixedly they did not feel harmless. 
and suddenly it let out a noise. Low, almost owl-like, a deep sound which resonated within its body, causing a reverberation which was accompanied by a wet, liquefied noise. A pause. A deep, automatic inhalation, gasp of fear which channeled its way into Jones's lungs. There they stayed for a moment of nothing, then slowly a protrusion. A sharp piece of its body sneaking out of the darkness under that wheel arch, moving softly through the air. It hovered directly over Jones's face, hypnotically pointed, dark brown, tinged with a muddy, earthy smell. It took him a moment to comprehend what he was seeing. So close to his face was the sharp object that it blurred and drew his stare toward the center of his nose, like a child attempting to cross their eyes. It looked like a talon, resembling that of a bird of prey, but it was not a talon, nor was it a nail or a horn. It was something new, something unseen and unknown within the animal kingdom. At least to him. All Jones knew and was now sure of was that it had sliced its way through the metal of the old girl's body and that it could gut him like a fish. And then a soft sound, almost calming. It was a vibration again, but it resembled a deep, gentle coo or the satisfied purr of a cat, and although Jones's intellect screamed for escape, his senses and his body slipped into an unanticipated, relaxed state at the sound. He remembered sitting under the television as a child on Sunday afternoon, watching an old B-movie, wondering how they did the effects with the rain crawling down the window outside, and his granddad snoozing in his chair. A comforting memory, and that sound elicited it from deep within. Two pieces of gelatinous flesh widened into the darkness, and from that human mouth stitched to that fluid body came a sound, a horrible, torturous howl, part animal, part human, and part something between. The talon sliced quickly and hooked into Jones's cheek. He remembered once more as a child catching his forearm with a fish hook, its barbed curves pulling and ripping at the skin. The hook of the creature's appendage had dug deep, through flesh and ligament, and onto the muscle of his face. He struggled for a moment, blinding pain shearing through his body. Once more their eyes met, prey and predator, and then Jones spoke, sure that somehow it could understand that he could compromise with the thing under the wheel arch, that a creature with the capacity for thinking resided there, certainly not something which could be loved, nor love in return, but perhaps in that facsimile of a human face there was a thought or emotion which resembled compassion. All the while the hook, its cold, barbed structure, buried deep within the muscles of the cheek, just above the jaw. Its sharpened end grazing slightly against the bone underneath. Please, no, Jones whimpered. The face within the darkness howled once more, and with a jolt, blood spouted upwards into Jones' left eye, leaving him momentarily blinded. The talon was obscured within the wheel arch again, but not before taking its prey's left cheek, muscle, ligament, flapping skin and all with it. Jones cried in agony and rolled out from under the car as soon as he was released. Reaching up, he felt a deep depression in his face, severed wiry anatomies which he could not name in the hard, abrasive texture of bone. Panic and horror shook him. Part of his face was gone, tore from him by that thing under the wheel arch. The back of the car began to shriek as the sound of metal being ripped and severed echoed out across the empty street. The old girl shook violently, shuddering, convulsing as if being tortured by a powerful assailant. Lying with his back against the ground, dazed, Jones's awareness focused once more at the familiar but now terrifying smell of petrol. It seeped out from under the car from a fatal wound soaking his denims. The old girl bled out, now useless, her master now trapped in that horrible street with that beast. The face appeared from under the car, its arms stretching out with limbs in peculiar places, contorted by an unnatural anatomy of doubled joints. As Jones held what was left of his face with his hand and turned to run, the wet and jerking yet quick movements of the creature's appendages clobbered and clambered over the pavement in pursuit. 
It was so fast, too fast, and its size had easily tripled since sliding out from underneath the car, its awkward limbs attached to that hideous face thrusting forward awkwardly like a spider squeezing forth from its venomous hole. Liquid poured in through the large opening in Jones's face, and he gasped for air. He was met with the sickening metallic taste of his own blood. He dared not to look back, but the beast drew closer and the sound of its slithering, contorting legs only outdone by the anguished, pain-ridden howl which escaped from its mouth. Jones stumbled. He clawed at the ground as he steadied himself. He realized where he was. At the door of that old, crumbling factory building, that place of scampering feet which once housed the busy human boiler suits and all, fixing, building, manipulating, making. But over the door lay an impenetrable wall of metal paneling. Thrusting his closed fist against the barrier, he pleaded, Help! Through broken teeth and a ruined jaw, please help me! He yelled once more. But there was no answer. And why should there be? For that place was long a shell of which the rodents had claimed for themselves. Creaking, slithering sounds shook out from the fervent movements of the creature as it closed in. And then that noise, that comforting lullaby purred from the beast. For the briefest of moments, Jones was transported to a childhood memory, one where he stood over the dead body of his pet hamster which had died in the night. His father took its lifeless corpse from its cage and laughed as he shook it, mimicking an unusual ventriloquist act, giving the little boy's dead pet a sickening and comical voice. Jones cried. Tears streamed down his face, mixing with blood and saliva which still spewed from his jaw and cheek. The purring, soothing sound continued from behind. Turning to view his predator, it stood there, staring at him. Jones's breath was labored and nervous, the cold air rushing through the hole in the side of his face, stinging deeply with each inhalation. Their eyes met once more. The face stared, letting out a painful gasp. With an abrupt burst of powerful strides, the creature tore across the overgrown grounds, leaping incredulously high with each movement, its talons raised. Jones let out a whimper as the mangled mess of legs and arms chased toward him. Shards of light glistened on what seemed to be a body and a head, its erratic movements whisking past strands of shadows which made it impossible to truly comprehend its anatomy. It howled and yelled and screamed in what approximated rage. A forceful breeze covered everything in an invincible cloud of movement, rattling one of the panels which covered a window at the side of the door. It had bent back, bent back, escape, help, run. Jones no longer accepted his fate, but rather saw something to hold on to. Hope and the promise of life, goddammit. Pulling himself to his feet with the palms of his hands against the blistered, once white walls of the factory building, the spindly, vicious legs of his pursuer clambered and wriggled even closer, but humans too can be nimble. Jones leapt for the ledge, which housed the bent panel standing about six feet from the ground. He scrambled and struggled and hauled himself up as fast as he could, but the beast was upon him. A blinding pain shot through his body as the talons sliced into the heel of his foot, cutting into meat and nicking a tendon. Retracting with force, it retrieved a bulbous piece of flesh from its prey. Wounded, but freed from its barred incision, Jones pulled at the flapping metal panel, losing his balance and falling inside in the process, into the darkness. Howls of derision and disgust bellowed from outside as he lay sprawled in agony on the floor. The ground was covered in a thick mixture of dust and powdered concrete. He coughed and sputtered as it invaded his lungs, assisted by the cold, still air of the place. Deep within, beams of light broke their way through fractures in the building shell, enough to allow his eyes to adapt to the darkness. The sound of the tangled monstrosity outside, climbing up on the ledge, sent a shudder of fear and dejection through his body once more. In a panicked fumble, he limped badly, knocking into a desk with a clatter. If he had the time, he would have thought that it was strange that such a place should retain its old furniture and belongings, but a light shone brightly from one of the street lamps outside as the creature pulled back the panel he had used like tinfoil, poking its bodied head with a gaping mouth through the gap, howling at the sight of a human hobbling in agony. Jones moved as quickly as he could, but in the panic, a thought permeated through the fury of senseless mess of the situation. He could never outrun it. 
A wet thud slithered through the air as a contorted mangle of legs or arms grappled to the floor, righting itself and then turning its body upwards in a strange convulsing gelatinous movement. With a shriek, it made for its prey moving violently over the desk, which once played a host to man or woman filling in a rota or paperwork before heading home to see their family. Through a door, Jones found himself in another room, then another, each displaying the forgotten remnants of a bygone era. A chair where someone once sat, a cabinet which held files and papers and consignments, orders from the troops, a peg where a boiler suit or a uniform of some description once hanged. Into another room, then down a short hallway populated by a thick layer of dusk, all the while the clambering, pacing movements of his recent roadkill chasing nearby. Closer and closer still it came as Jones threaded through the maze of rooms and hallways, his inner leg dragging painfully, desperate to keep up. Slamming a door shut behind him, he pulled a large metallic table onto its side, the pitter patter of blood dripping from his face, twinkling into the light, bouncing off the metal surface like rain. Heaving it quickly across the hallway, he forced it against the door. Then another table, a collection of chairs, and finally a rusted cabinet which housed the forgotten musings of the factory's once deliberate foreman. In the slightest of pauses, he dug deep into his denim pockets and produced a mobile phone. Its screen was shattered, most probably from the fall into the building. There was no hope of fixing it, and with that loss came the realization that he was truly on his own. The tangled mess of man-made objects quivered as the scuttling, many-legged creature pushed and howled against the makeshift barricade. With each effort, Jones watched an exhausted gasping horror as the door inched its way open piece by piece with each crash of a mangled limb. There wasn't much time. Soon it would be there. In the dim light, he looked desperately for a mode of escape. Nearby sat a sterile staircase leading up to another floor. He did not want to risk being trapped away from the ground, away from being able to escape that thing, but there was nowhere else to turn. With an echoing crash, the cabinet fell to the floor as the door now opened wide enough for the creature to place one of its long legs through the gap. But was it a leg? Revulsion boiled into the pit of Jones's stomach as what looked like a human hand began to claw at the obstructions on the other side, pulling them away to free its path. Fight or flight, Jones took the staircase. In any other situation, he would have been reluctant to enter the darkened stairwell, but between the unknown and that creature... Only madness would choose the pursuer. Globules of sweat and blood congealed on the side of his face as he ascended the stairs. For the first time, thoughts of just giving up entered his mind, and it occurred to him that he must have looked like one of those deer on a natural history program when they literally give in to the shock and horror of a painful death brought on by a brutal predator. A crash rang out and a howl of derision sounded once more. The beast had broken through Jones's hasty construction and was quickly making its way to the staircase. Finally, he reached the top of the stairs where there lay a broken door rotting on the ground. It had at one time sat proudly at the entrance to an office, but now lay torn and mangled on the floor. The brass nameplate, which at one time would have carried the handle of someone of importance, now scarred and disfigured, unrecognizable even to those who must have known or had a covenant with the place. With little thought, he staggered, gasping for air through the empty doorway. He stood in an office. In its center lay a large, austere desk, accompanied by a torn green leather armchair. At the back of the room lay a second broken doorway, which Jones viewed gratefully as another route of escape. Even in his frantic state of mind, he could not help but notice the papers strewn across the floor, on the desk and pinned to the walls. They spoke of construction, of design, of strange diagrams, and of processes and calculations, but they were meaningless to Jones as he struggled across the room, dripping sweat and blood and fear on the notes below. He could hear the creature climbing the stairs, but at last a piece of luck. With all of its unnatural appendages, it ascended slowly, much slower than Jones himself had. The old stairwell had bought him some time. Reaching the exit, he found himself standing on a graded platform, looking over what must have been the main factory hall. 
where all the work would have been done, and there was no doubt the occupant of the office would have kept an eye on the workers below, observing sternly. Surprised again at the sheer amount of machinery which had been left there to rust and erode with time, Jones began to descend a set of metal stairs which led back down onto the factory floor. Once on the ground, perhaps, he could get away from that place, find a door or window which would allow for his escape. Maybe he would not follow. Each step down the staircase was accompanied by shooting pains which seared up his body. It became clear that he'd torn a muscle or ligament in his good leg while running, but still he had to push on and get away from his pursuer. Reaching the factory floor, the collection of machinery around him now towered above. All manner of drills and tables and unfamiliar tools dripped fluids onto the floor, their once chattering movements and mechanisms now silent. A technological tomb best served as a museum for the wary. Clawed arms, thrusting pistons, glass chambers, and a mess of tubes and pipes surrounded him. None of it made sense. Their internal workings, nor their purpose, clear. Just what did they make here? That now too familiar howl screamed from the platform above. That rippled green and gray withered female face oozed out foul liquids from its approximation of a mouth. Screaming in anger as it awkwardly, step by step, hand by hand, talon by talon, made its way down the stairs. Jones scrambled in fear, staggering between the countless mechanical relics. The wound in his foot made it almost impossible to continue with any success. Tired, whimpering, and utterly devoid of hope, he did as best he could to duck below a strange machine with two large armed pincers, hoping to get out of sight as he climbed under its manufactured protection. It was as if the creature knew he was hiding. The howls of anger and hatred had ceased, replaced only by the sound of its vicious, multiple footsteps echoing throughout the factory hall, scraping, tapping, clicking. The weight was torturous, and with every breath more blood oozed out from the hole in his face and the wound in his foot, the pain was becoming increasingly unbearable. Occasionally, he would glimpse the creature's double-jointed strides, clambering around the factory floor, its warded skin rubbing against the dust-covered ground, producing the sound of sandpaper on wood, which turned Joan's stomach. And then with no warning, the noises ceased. Silence. Minutes passed, and still there was little or no sound in the old factory building. Finally, a wisp of vitality returned to his being once more, and the thought of the creature having left. Anger at being hunted, frustration, pain at the thought of being hideously scarred for the rest of his life took him. His heart beat rapidly as he prepared to act. He was going to escape, damn it. And when he did, when he did... He would be back with an entire troop of pest control or animal control or whatever was required. And he'd laugh, yes, he'd laugh, as they fumigated the place and hunted that disgusting beast down, letting its lungs fill with poisoned air or its stomach burn with arsenic placed in its food. And then a slow, horrible, painful death, one which was so clearly deserved. But first he had to escape and he had to take the opportunity presented by his pursuer's absence. Uncurling his feet, Jones slowly rose up from underneath the strange, pensered machine. Where was it? Where had that piece of vermin gone? But those thoughts diminished. Salvation prevented itself. On the nearest wall lay a window, a beautiful, boarded-up forgotten window obscured from the outside world by a board which fluttered in the night breeze. It cracked its wooden body against the worn building in defiance. Yes, it was free, attached only by a few rusted nails, no doubt on the top of the window frame. If he could make it there, Jones would most definitely be able to get outside and hope that that creature had slunk off its rancid little hole somewhere in the building. It was only about 15 feet away. But with a dragging leg behind him, that seemed like an eternal distance. But nothing ventured, nothing gained. And if Jones hadn't been missing a chunk of his cheek, he would have smiled. Looking around one last time, he decided to make his move. 
Each hobbled step and dragged foot cut through the silence, and he was sure that at any moment the beast would leap out at him. But the factory hall remained quiet. The machinery did not stir, nor did their watcher. With a rush of excitement, he finally reached the boarded window. Pushing at the panel, it lifted quite easily, and the fact gave him the impression that it was ready to fall to the ground outside should a strong enough wind catch it. He sucked the cool night air into his lungs, staring out at the empty street ahead, and for the shortest of moments, felt hope to be gone from that place. And then a noise sounded. That sweet calming, purring, which had brought back memories of home and of bad times and good. Turning cautiously to his side, a shaft of light streamed in front of the streets outside and illuminated what looked like a vice or a pressing machine on the other side of the hall. There, the beast cooed and purred softly with motherly devotion. A mass of slithering and garbled sounds whispered from the darkness quivering and huddling together, countless infantile versions of the creature from under the old girl. It occurred to Jones that all along the beast was perhaps caring for its own young, protecting them from the clanking and screeching of his own mechanical beast. Perhaps he could be loved, and love in return. And for that moment he felt no anger toward it, no hatred, not rage, just understanding. Slipping out quietly between the panel and once white paint of the factory building, Jones slowly but surely began to limp toward the old girl. He knew he'd probably have to struggle to get to the nearest pocket of civilization to get help, but if there was any way that the old girl could still get him even one little piece closer to the hospital, then he'd be grateful. A thunderous bang sounded as the creature, that loving, caring, cooing mother or father, burst through the window panel shell of the old factory building. Jones had no time to turn, let alone react, as the beast thrust one of its legged talons deep into the back joint of his right leg, the good leg. With one swift motion, Jones yelled and crumpled to the ground as the beast hooked his kneecap from inside and ripped it clean out the back of his leg. Its arms and appendages battered away, piercing up and down its prey's body like a typewriter before moving off. Jones lay there, the life bleeding out of him, watching in anguish as the creature scuttled over to the old girl still parked faithfully out front. As the street lights flickered above, the dim light of Jones's life slowly faded to a single point, soon to be extinguished last glimpse of the world for him, a mass of armed and legged things tearing apart the old girl piece by piece, taking the metal, frames, seats, and wheels into darkened doorways nearby. The sound of clanking and manipulating and twisting rang out into the night along with a final thought. I wonder what they make in here. A razor talon hovered above. Joan's body was discovered three months later by a group of kids who had decided to explore the area for fun, but also with a healthy hope of finding some scrap they could sell. His body had been consumed twice, once by the rats and then again by the earth, obscured as his remains were by weeds and roots and soiled, converting him into an empty shell, a forgotten grave not unlike the factory gates resting beside him. His death remained unexplainable due to the hideous condition of his body, but one thing was clear. His head was missing. This caused many arguments between two medical experts. One claimed that the head had been eaten by rats, much like the rest of his body, but the other noted a clean strike to the neck bone, almost as if his head had been surgically removed. 